Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good morning. Uh, that sound didn't sound good. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> Losing them, oh, Swing. I'm, yeah, I've lost you already. Well, Ms. Swing, can we do the prelude, please? Thank you. I was in a hurry. Oh, okay. <laughs> My first mistake for today.
praise you. You are my everything. Lord, I love to praise you. You are the song I sing. Lord, I love to praise you. You mean the world to me. Lord, I love to praise you. Thank you for love. Welcome to St. James. We welcome you into this house of the Lord. We gather in his presence and in each other's presence to worship. Are there any first time visitors with us this morning who might want to give a shout out or make a statement or a testimony or, okay. Seeing none, we are all family. We are all children of God, and we worship in his name. you to stand as you are able as we call one another to worship. Do you feel it? God's kingdom is beneath our feet. We live in the new creation shaped by God out of our brokenness. Do you know it? 
God's reconciling love in Christ has shattered our ways of viewing people. No longer do we label our sisters and brothers. We welcome them with open arms. Do you believe it? God has made everything, including us, new. And sends us forth to share this good news with everyone. Please remain standing for our opening song, My Hope is Built, number 368. Yeah. 
Sometimes when I can't come up with the right words to pray, I go in my closet and in silence, in the shower, and that's where my prayers come. Many times, what comes to mind for me is the 23rd Psalm, which my mother taught to us <clears throat> as a prayer. So in the past two or three weeks, I've just been saying it out loud and in my head the way my mother taught us to pray. So I'm going to use the 23rd Psalm today for our prayer. Because in the end, when I can't think of anything else to say, it's like, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. And then the 23rd comes, and then I hear my mother's voice. So please bow your heads with me. This is how my mother taught me to pray. The Lord is my shepherd. Because I am his. I'm just not one of the people out there in the flock. I shall not want because he knows our needs and he supplies the way. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He provides that rest, that respite, and he provides it abundantly. He leadeth me, us, beside the still waters, the cool, peaceful refreshment that we so need for so many times. He leadeth me, us, and the paths of righteousness. He guides us. And in his guidance, we follow his will. For his name's sake. Because we look to him for the higher purpose in life. Truly, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, some may say he's testing. He's still leading us. No matter what, in the darkest valley and in death, nothing formed against me today shall prosper because I have God. I will fear no evil. He's my shield. He's my breastplate. And we know that we are always protected by him, even in our darkest hours. Thou prepares a table before me, us, in the presence of our enemies, whatever that enemy may be. Hate, racism, addiction, whatever. He will dedicate his love and consecrate us so that we may be able to rid ourselves. Our cup runneth over, Lord, doesn't it? His abundance flows throughout, and that abundance is our blessing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's a power of grace. It's the power of our faith. As my mother would say, you can't have faith unless you see God, even if it's only in your mind. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's the ultimate home that security for us to, to know that no matter what's going on down here, we have a home. 
and the last word says forever. That's now and always. And in the end, we can say, Lord, I love to praise you. We offer this prayer, dear God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for all the provisions. We thank you, Lord, for our friends and family. We ask your blessings upon our nation, the world, our state, our local leaders, our bishop, our pastors, and each and every one of us so that that love that we receive from you can reside in us. And when it resides in, resides in us, we have no other option than to share it with others. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. church. Good morning. Today culminates the last Sunday for Women's History Month. Today I'm going to bring a message to you and show you a, a short little slide of the Dixie Three Icon Nurses. During the modern civil rights movement, many people took a stand for human rights. Some like Mildred Smith, Patricia Taylor, and Agnes Stokes took a seat. Could you show the first slide? This is their story. In the early 1960s, Dixie Hospital, later known as Centera Hampton General, was segregated. Black patients, with the exception of newborns, were treated on the second floor. The other five stories were for whites. Segregation extended to the employees. After buying meals in the cafeteria, white employees could remain in the cafeteria. Black employees had to take their meals to a small classroom where some had to eat standing up. Mildred, Patricia, and Agnes decided to eat lunch in the new spacious whites only cafeteria rather than the cramped basement. A reprimand from the director of nursing did little to deter them. The women repeated their defiant act the next day and were fired. They sued the hospital for racial discrimination. Those are the three women walking out of the hospital after they had been fired. Three years later, in a decision affirming that racial discrimination was illegal in publicly funded institutions, the fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ordered Dixie Hospital to reinstate the nurses and give them full back pay. The Dixie Three 
also opened up further dialogue about racism and bias in nursing, medicine, and healthcare in a historical context. Slide two. The Dixie Three icons, uh, these are the ladies. Two are still living. Patricia Taylor McKenzie lives in D.C. in the Maryland area. And Agnes Stokes Chisman lives in Hampton. And Mildred Smith passed in 2013. Slide three. The Dixie Three, a story on civil rights and nursing film, was written and produced by Denitra Hampton. Hampton is a Suffolk resident and a retired U.S. Navy nurse corps officer whose unlikely second act became filmmaking. She founded For Nurses by Nurses Productions to tell of some of the profession's most captivating stories. The film was based on the landmark civil rights case that occurred at Hampton's Dixie Hospital. Starring in the film are registered nurses Melanie Outlaw, Angela Mitchell, and Tawana Lottery, a Lori. These are Hampton University graduates, and they are all nurses. This story was shown uh, February the 21st to the 22nd at the Hampton Museum for the Public Free. Debbie, myself, and Yvette Smalls Cooper went to the museum and saw the film. It was too long to show in church, so I just given y'all a little excerpt of it. But you can go out there online. I don't know if they're still showing it, but it was really a nice film that she did. Hampton hopes that the Dixie Three will not only eliminate a little known event, but also offer a big picture reflection on the challenges that continue in the industry such as health inequities. She is also the producer of the groundbreaking documentary, The Black Angels, A Nurse's Story, that gave voice to 300 black angels out of Staten Island, New York, who cared for patients with tuberculosis when there was no cure. Thank you all. History is everywhere, isn't it? We just yes. have to go look for it. Thank you, Nancy. My aunt, my mother's sister, uh, was a nurse. And she was a nurse at what was called Brewster Hospital at the time, which had only one floor for black patients. She would talk a lot about that and how um, it was difficult for the patients. Excuse me, I just put the book away that I needed. Psalm 33. 32. 32. 32. Error number two. Error number two for today. We're Are you keeping you. count? We're with you. <laughs> so, Nobody's counting. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Psalm 32, found in your hymnal page 766, and we will read responsibly. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed are those whom the Lord does not hold guilty, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I did not declare my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as if by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let those who are godly offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of great waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You encompass me with deliverance. 
I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like an unruly horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle. Many are the pains of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O all, all righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from Joshua chapter 9, verses 9, error number 3, chapter 5, verses 9 through 12. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The produce of the land, the manna ceased on the day that they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Please stand as you are able for our New Testament reading. Luke 15, verses 1 through 3 and then verses 11b through 32. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And we'll go on to verse 11. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his prosperity and dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him any, anything. But when he came to himself and said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, 
your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. These are the word of our Lord and Savior for the people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able for our song of preparation from the faith we sing, number 2053, if it had not been for the Lord. Let us turn to God and be in prayer. Almighty God, send your spirit upon us as we hear your word read and sung and proclaimed, that you might lead us to repent and reconcile. This in all things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. During Lent, it can be easy to view this season of penitence as one focused on sin, separation, and shame. We can use Lenten disciplines as a way to self-flagellate, to wear sackcloth and ashes in scriptural terms, to bear the crosses of giving up chocolate, (laughs) 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 or committing to a new prayer practice. The word penitence itself comes from words that mean not enough, missing, or lacking. 
inviting us to the self-examination that will always shine light on our deficiencies. The tradition of Lenten practice draws on the example of Jesus' 40 days of self-deprivation in the desert. But in our real lives, we might be able to relate to those 40 days beyond the season between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. And likewise, we might also join in celebrating other aspects of Jesus' life beyond penance during the season of Lent. The scriptures today lend themselves to reflection and confession, but also lead us into the abundance of forgiveness and reconciliation. Amen. Transformation or con conversion can be a struggle. There's a normal, then a liminal phase of change, turning, transition, and then a new, perhaps steady, unsteady normal. That middle section is tricky, sometimes awkward, and usually scary. It requires determination and discipline, as well as surrender and trust. But to repair the breach, we must enter it. To receive forgiveness, we must repent. The story of Israel is written in the book of Joshua as an explanation of origin. Here is where we were. Here is where we then went. Here is where we are now going. In chapter 5, we come upon Israel in that awkward, unsteady, or perhaps uneasy, liminal phase, that transition, that in-between. The nation had finished wandering the desert, completing their own 40 years of deprivation, Generations before Jesus chose his own pilgrimage of 40 days in the desert. The exile of the nation of Israel could be interpreted as a symbol of punishment for the faithlessness of Israel in ignoring their covenant with God. But now, after the wandering, God fulfills the promise of restoring the people to Israel. And at Gilgal, they celebrate. Instead of living manna to manna, paycheck to paycheck, we might say, <laughs> hopeful and trusting that food would emerge temporarily and daily from the earth as they had in the desert, the nation of Israel now feasts on the produce of the land. They eat the crops of the land of Canaan planted by others and harvested by themselves. Now the conquerors instead of the conquered. It's a real comeback story. If the exile is read as a punishment for faithlessness, then the return to the Jordan is a sign of God's favor and forgiveness. Israel has paid their dues. Twisted and turned through whining and gratitude, dragging and being dragged through the deserts, and are now rewarded with abundance, a literal feast. Usually the cause for repentance comes from ourselves. The power of evil always desires to separate us from one another, from God even from ourselves, but we're given the freedom of choice to give in to that power or not. Sometimes it's intentional, acting out of ambition or selfishness or ego. Sometimes we look up and find ourselves lost, the sheep who wandered away from the flock. In whatever ways we sin or turn our backs on God, God is waiting to meet us yes. when we return. Yes. Yes. We turn and return, turn and return in a cosmic dance of sin and repentance, met always by forgiveness. Much of Psalm 32 expresses the turmoil of 
shame and regret and angst one might feel when they're not following the path of Jesus. And snuck into this psalm, one little half verse, half of half of a verse. It says, then you forgave me the guilt of my sin, period. I confessed, then you forgave me. The point of self-examination is not to find fault, but to find fertile ground for transformation. Repentance is less about trying to nitpick our lives to find every shameful and sinful action we've ever done, and, and more about recognizing God's love and mercy, and how they're vastly wider than God's anger. Where are we in a muddle? Where can we invite mercy? Where can God take root? What are the opportunities to turn and return? It's for good reason that we call the practice of the same individual confession as confession and pardon. Confession doesn't stand alone, but it always stands in our liturgy with pardon. It is an act of reconciliation. Books can be read on the subtle differences between reconciliation and reparations, and restitution, just as tomes are written on the comparisons of grace, mercy, and forgiveness. What is at times more relevant to the Christian life is the experience of brokenness when repair is needed. Amen. It's a big ask to loosen our grip on what we have. Whether resources have been earned or given, Sharing them requires mutual respect and humility. The famous brothers in the story of the prodigal son, maybe better called the parable of the forgiving father, Amen. provides us with a lifetime's worth of lessons. Jesus tells this story as an illustration for widening the table, loosening the grip on power. The religious leaders were grumbling about how Jesus shared meals with the lowlifes, the destitute, and shameful. And in response, Jesus talks about two brothers and their father. As it is written, the story invites us to compare the siblings as foils to each other, a goofus and gallant contrast. But thinking about the parable as an explanation of Jesus' behavior it makes it problematic to think about the brothers as a dichotomy, as, as polar opposites of each other. That's not really the point. It, instead, we can think about the overarching theme of transformation. Now, the younger brother, that prodigal son, leaves one normal day experiences pain and mess and desperation, and returns, returns repentant. And he doesn't come back and demand a place as the son of his father. He's looking for a job because his previous job wasn't working out so well, and he realized his dad was a pretty good employer. Those people had it a lot better than he did. So maybe, just maybe, his father's heart would be big enough to hire him because he'd squandered everything else. Now, the elder brother had, has elegantly entered a new normal when his brother departed. He was diligently doing his work and assuming the responsibility of a loyal heir. His brother's return interrupts this and forces a new normal on him, one which is jarring and uncomfortable. So he refuses to go to this party that's now being thrown for his little brother. He enters his own liminal space between what was and what will be. The father, who easily stands in as the Savior or Creator, 
It doesn't stand idly by as his sons grapple with their identities and and struggles and roles in the family system. The father steps into the liminal space to meet his sons. He runs out to meet his youngest son when he's coming home. He sees him far off and he doesn't even know that the son is yet repentant at all. He, he doesn't know why the son is coming home. For all he knows, maybe he's trying to come back and take the rest, right? But he runs out and meets him as far as he can. And then throwing the party for the younger son, embracing and welcoming him in, he comes to realize that his eldest son hasn't joined. He couldn't bring himself to be part of that party. And instead of waiting there for the eldest son to come to his senses, he goes out to the elder son, meets him in that that liminal space, that uneasy space, that that space where the elder son is struggling with, with that change between what was and what will be. The parent doesn't wait until the child has figured himself out, but he reaches out and accompanies both of them through repentance and return and transformation. In rabbinic literature that is commentary on In the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament, there is a story of reaching and return, which is summed up like this. A king had a son who had gone astray from his father on a journey of a hundred days. His friend said to him, return to your father. He, He said, I cannot. Then his father sent word, return as far as you can and I will come the rest of the way to you. So God says, return to me, and I will return to you. The child needs to go through the journey of repentance, restitution, reparation, in order to repair the breach, but is always met with accompaniment and hospitality, just as God always meets us with forgiveness. Forgiveness from God is a, a clean slate, no, a no grudges kind of love, but human reconciliation requires sacrifice. We are reconciled to God in Christ, and so we must live out the same ministry of reconciliation. The self-examination offered to us during this season of Lent ought to reveal the transformation that comes from repentance, sacrifice, and forgiveness. Reconciliation, repair, restitution, reparations, all the the other re-words make up a a twisty-turny dance of liminality and transformation. May we all follow the road of humility and reflection, and may we all be met with God's abundance. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you are able and join together as we affirm our faith using Selection 887 in the United Methodist Hymnal, an affirmation from the 8th chapter of Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. No. In In all all things things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We We are sure that that neither death nor life, nor nor angels, nor nor principalities, principalities, nor things things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. As a reminder, as we continue with our COVID mitigation protocols, we're not passing the plate among the pews, but we have a basket in the narthex. So at the end of the service, as you're making your way out, you're invited to place your offerings in that basket. Now let us continue our worship.
Now for our announcements. We have a purple insert, just like to bring um, some attention to our faithfulness prayers. Those listed, President Biden, Bishop Lewis, Governor Yunkin, District Superintendent, Reverend Ledlam, Reverend Dr. Ledlam Bates, um, for our pastor, Reverend Dr. Nelson, Mayor Tuck and all city and state officials, our military personnel and their families, our students, especially our students and our teachers, especially our teachers and administrators in those schools who are having such a hard time. The least, the last, and the lost, and all who are sick, shut in, or experiencing hardships. And we have a list of those which we should be praying for, especially Candace Wake, Adrenia Johnson, Bill Williams, Pat Bacon, Helen Hooks, and Nietha, Nietha Mike, Mack. So keep those names in prayer. Also, the Wyatt family. Stan Wyatt lost his brother suddenly. Absolutely, yes. Um, and uh, the family of um, the Hatcher. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, John Hatcher. Uh, John Hatcher. Um, when I got the news, I was just, I'm sure as everybody was, floored. Just floored. But then I thought of the 23rd Psalm again, in the valley of the shadow of death. John and Myrtle Francis are up there in heaven just preaching their little time pods off. <laughs> if you have an announcement for the bulletin, just a reminder, make sure you get it to Miss Althea by Tuesday at noon. And also, if you have announcements that you would have to would like to have read um, from the pulpit, get it to the liturgist in writing before the services. That's 8.30 and 11. Today is UM Corps Sunday, a church-wide special Sunday of the United Methodist Church. Your contribution ensures UM Corps' response in times of crisis, and 100% of contributions given to UM Corps for a disaster go to help for that disaster, including, as we all were told by the pastor a couple of weeks ago, for the people of Ukraine. So if you want to support the people of Ukraine, write on the envelope, advance nine eight number 982450 Ukraine. Um, thank you for your generosity. The special envelopes are provided in your bulletin here. So you can write somewhere here, I guess, or on the outside that you want it to go to. 982 Ukraine. Harold Richardson and Terry Cobbs. No, they're not wanted for anything. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Terry's not sure. Mama's not sure. This is a sanctuary. <laughs> Uh, words cannot express how grateful we are for your kindness and generosity with getting the church van up and running. We are excited to plan some adventures so that you can take the members, so that we can take the members on outings. We want to thank you publicly, even though you're not public enemy number one, <laughs> for your hard work and dedication to the 70 plus ministry. Thank you. The 70 plus ministry. Uh, our COVID mitigation guidelines are printed again. Um, as we've been experiencing lately, um, masks are optional. However, if you feel more comfortable wearing your mask, uh, please do so. We are keeping our distance, our social distancing. Um, and we are, are we still, we're sanitizing the sanctuary after each service? No. No, no we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're not doing that. No. Okay. So, 
Um, we're kind of leaning into the new um, pandemic experiences. So uh, we're still celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. You can continue to support this mission by just including your, I don't know, hundred dollar bill, thousand dollar check, <laughs> in an offering envelope, and just write on the outside birthday bank. It will get to Miss. Uh, Yolanda Cobb, and she um, appreciates it. We have a list of some uh, St. James College students that you may write uh, or send a card or something for encouragement, some chocolate, uh, provided they're not giving up chocolate for Lent. You can still send them cookies and all those kinds of things to give them a little respite in their, their days of studying. Um, also, if you have a college student that you would like to be added to this list, get that information to Ms. Althea at the church website listed, no, church email listed here. We're also still lifting up uh, staff sergeant, Terry Cobbs, he's the son of Ter uh, Terry, no. not Terry Justin Cobbs. Cobbs. Justin Cobbs. <laughs> Is Terry Is somebody keeping count of all my errors? <laughs> no. <laughs> Justin Cobb, son of Terry and Yolanda. Yes. He will be back sometime next month. Yes. Thank all right. You. So we we got him in our prayers. If you're gonna send them something, you better get it in the mail right away because April is just a week, a week away. His address is here. I'm sorry, Horace, yes. Okay, so if you didn't hear that, well, the men are having United Methodist Men uh, prayer breakfast next Saturday in the fellowship hall, correct? Yes. 9 a.m. Correct. Pass it on. <laughs> I'm done making errors. It's All your right. turn. I just want to uh, give a, another couple of notes about uh, John Hatcher's uh, service uh, as well. Um, so this information went out by email, but just a reminder that today uh, is the wake. Uh, we'll be at R.W. Baker Funeral Home in Suffolk. It's going to be from 3 to 6. The funeral will be tomorrow at St. James Episcopal Church in Portsmouth. Uh, and that's at 11 o'clock. Uh, information that I've uh, seen going around about it uh, reminds folks that it is a very small space. It's a small worship space. Um, they have not said that it's just for family and close friends, um, but they are telling people if you do want to, to go there uh, and to, to sit there, you should go early to, to get that space. Now, St. James Episcopal does... Um, uh, stream their services on their Facebook page, uh, as we do, and I heard from them they are going to be streaming the service tomorrow, so that will be available on their Facebook page, and that's at 11 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to be sending out an, an email with the, the link uh, to that, so, and also on our Facebook page, linking to their Facebook page. <laughs> um, so hopefully, it, you know, we'll make that a little bit easier if, if you do want to... Um, you know, the, uh, watch uh, that stream service, then you'll be able to do so. Um, and so that uh, that will be going out uh, later today and tomorrow. And for today, I want to thank all those who made the service possible today. Thank you to our ushers for welcoming us into the sanctuary and bringing the light of Christ in among us and leading us as we go from here with the light of Christ lighting our path. And to Tracy for uh, being our uh, media specialist today and running that for us. Thank you. To Nancy for bringing uh, our uh, 
the Women's History Moment today on behalf of the United Women in Faith. Yes, right. thank you. <laughs> they, I, I need to repeat that as much as I can so it, uh, it comes out a little, a little quicker. And to Maria for leading us in music, enabling us all to lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving. And Janina for joining in uh, on the piano as well as singing with our wonderful choir today and the beautiful gifts that, that you uh, bring us each time you sing. Thank you to Terry for uh, being our percussionist and uh, overseeing the media and getting us uh, online and enable us to, to be heard within the house as well. And thank you, Gwen, for your wonderful leadership as liturgist and your beautiful testimony and prayer uh, this morning. And thank you to all of you for gathering to be the body of Christ in worship. Now, as we prepare to go and be the body of Christ in the world, I invite you to stand and join together in our closing hymn, number 378, Amazing Grace. <laughs> God sends us forth to be reconcilers of the broken and oppressed. Jesus, our brother, sends us to welcome everyone, to embrace the prodigals with joy, and make a feast for all of God's people. The Spirit sends us with arms full of healing to bring hope to all we meet. Go in peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you.